Thank you so much, Kirsty. Uh, hello, everyone. It's really good to be here again to see uh, one or two familiar names and a couple of names as well that I don't recognize. Uh, so really hoping that you're all going to enjoy uh, what we've got to offer you uh, today. So we're talking about uh, creating and manipulating linear and quadratic expressions. Uh, so we've got three tasks picked out. And the plan is that Charlie and I are going to introduce the tasks. Some of them are ones that Charlie knows a little bit better than I do. Some of them are ones that I know a little bit better. Uh, and so between us, we're going to introduce the tasks. We'll all have a go at them together. And then we'll talk about some of the pedagogy uh, behind it. And so really, I think the big ideas that we're hoping to explore today are around how algebra can sometimes be a source of tension with students. It's uh, the point where lots of students start to find maths quite challenging. Sometimes we get that pushback from students about not seeing the point of algebra. So we've chosen some tasks that we think make algebra come alive a little bit more, that show that there is a reason for suddenly complicating our maths by putting letters in as well as numbers, and to give students purposeful practice at trying uh, trying to solve, um, trying to simplify algebraic expressions and create algebraic expressions. So, Charlie, I'm going to let you introduce yourself as well, and uh, maybe you've got something to add, and then we can get started on our first task. Um, I'm not sure there's anything really to add to your introduction. Um, <clears throat> so I think I will go straight to the first task. <clears throat> um, those of you who um, are attending, um, if you have a sheet, a sheet of A4, oh, sorry, A4 handy, it'd be really good if you could um, take it and sort of replicate what I'm going to do with my sheet of A4. It might, it might just help. Uh, it's not essential because I'm going to share uh, my visualizer, so you should be able to see my desk. But if you've got one handy, you might want to do that. So I'm going to share my screen straight away. So I'm starting with a sheet of A5, A, I keep saying A5, A4. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine I fold it in half and then I'm going to cut that and the other half is going to be cut. And then I'm going to carry on doing this until I've got five pieces, which I've put on the desk, on my desk here. So this was originally a sheet of A4. I cut, um, I have got the, the top half, then the bottom half got cut in half. The bottom right-hand corner got cut in half. And then the bottom eighth got cut in half. So I've got five pieces. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to label the edges of my smallest piece and I'm going to call the smallest edge A and the larger edge B. So Alison, can you tell me what I should label the edges for my slightly bigger rectangle. Okay, so I've just arranged my pieces in front of me. Uh, one thing that I would do if I was working on this task in the classroom is I would be checking and double checking that everybody ends up with five pieces because once you're doing the folding in half and tearing it, it's really easy to get carried away and end up with a smaller, smallest rectangle. So I guess a good thing that uh, you could do for that is just to get everyone to take the smallest piece and compare it with the person sitting next to them. And if you've got the same size, smallest rectangle, then you know you've done the right number of steps. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm looking at that uh, second smallest rectangle. 
And I know that I've got the piece divided into half. So its height is going to be B, the same as the, the longer side of the bottom rectangle. But then its width is two of those lengths A. So I might say that it is A plus A, or I might simplify it to 2A. Okay. What about the next one, the next biggest one? So again, I'm going to do the height first because I can compare it to the right-hand side where I've got B plus B. So I'm going to simplify that to 2B. And then the bottom of it is the same width as the other half of the paper, which is A plus A, which is 2A. Do you want me to do the top one as well? Well, that's quite nice. Just looking at the the, the smallest one and the one that you've just Oh, done. that's an enlargement, isn't it? So... Because it's double the height and double the length. Yes. Um, and the area of the first one is AB and the area of the bigger one is 4AB. And you can see that we can fit four of these smaller ones into the bigger one. Okay, last one, do you wanna do the last one? Oh, I suppose so. Uh, the width, I've got 2A plus A plus A going along the bottom. So that's going to be 4A altogether. And then it's the same height as the bottom half of the page. So it's 2B or not to be, that is the question. Okay, so I'm going to set you a challenge just with the biggest and the smallest piece. I'm you... now wishing that I'd written down those uh, values as we were going along. Uh, so I think perhaps if I was if I was teaching using this task, I would tell the students to write the dimensions on each piece uh, because I think it makes it much easier to keep track of things later on. So you've got the A and B piece and then the 2B and 4A piece. Okay. Yeah. I'm good now. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to have a rule that whenever I put, I'm going to call them tiles. Uh, whenever I put two or more tiles together, they've got to be touching edge to edge and they've got to meet um, at at least one of the corners. Um, actually, I'm not sure about the corners. Uh, forget about that. I'm going to make okay. mine. But they've got, to, they've got to line up at edge to, to edge. It's Am cool. I allowed to have overlaps? Can I have it sticking out at the bottom? No. Like, could I do something like that, for example? No. So that's not allowed. Okay. So that maybe is... if we stick if we stick to corner to corner to start off with, and then it means that I'm not going to do anything crazy. Yes. Okay. So my question to you is, what is the perimeter of the combined shape that I've got there? Okay, so uh, while everybody's thinking about that, if anybody has got the answer quicker than me, please feel free to drop it in the chat. But I'm going to talk through what I think a student might say uh, if I had two people discussing this with their partner, how they might work out the perimeter. So along the bottom of the shape, I've got 4A and then another A, so that's 5A altogether. And then going up the left-hand side, it's 2B. Then going across the top, it's 4A. And then I need to work out what that piece going down the side is, and it's 2B minus B, so that's just B then it's A going across and then it's B going down. So I need to write all this down because that was too much to hold in my head. But I think going around the shape, I've got Shall five. I, uh, Shall I do write it down for me? Yes, I'll do, I'll do the writing for you. Brilliant, thank you. So, so start again. 
There we go. Okay, so can you write down for me then uh, 5A? Just remind us where the 5A comes from. That That's the bottom. 4A plus A is 5A. Then going up the left-hand side is 2B, so plus 2B. And then going across the top is 4A, so plus 4A. And then going down the right-hand side, I've got 1B, because it's 2B take away B. Then I've got plus A for the top of that little bit. And then I've got plus B for down the right-hand side. So all together, I've got 5 plus 4 is 9 plus 1 is 10A plus 4B. Okay. And it'd be great for students to do that. Um, at some stage, some students might realise that the horizontal distances, the horizontal distance at the bottom is equivalent to the horizontal distances along the top and the middle. So if this is 5A, then those two distances are 5A. So I get 10A just like you did. And likewise, this vertical distance must match those two vertical distance distances. Um, it's almost like I'm going to be going up there and later I'm going to be going down. So the amount I went up there must match the amount I went down. And likewise, um, if I start here and I go to the right, that must match those distances going to the left. So that's another yeah. thing. Another and way. I think that that means that your corner to corner constraint, we could relax that slightly because I think you could slide that rectangle uh, up a little bit. So I've done something like that on mine. And I might think to start off with that I can't work out the perimeter of that shape because I don't know how far I've moved it up but I still know that I've got 2B minus B separated out between those two things and B there making 2B altogether on that right-hand side. So this is really getting students to think about using those unknowns. And if they weren't quite happy with that argument, you could get them to think about representing that little bit as uh as an unknown and then expressing that in terms of it and so you'd have something like x and b minus x and then when you add them together you get uh x plus b minus x and the x's cancel out um so this distance so here... that bit is going to be 2b minus b minus x and then when i add everything from there to there, I'm going to have an X, a B, a 2B, a minus B, and a minus X. So the X and the B will cancel out with the minus B and the minus X. And so I'll get 2B for the whole thing. Exactly. And so I guess part of this activity is about helping students to become confident and fluent in using algebra to represent unknowns because it doesn't matter if your piece of paper is 10 and a half centimetres and uh, five and a quarter centimetres and whatever else it is. Um, it, it matters what the relationship is between the two rectangles. And so we can move away from using units of measurement and measuring everything in terms of a and B, which I think if you made them calculate the dimensions of a an A4 piece of paper, which I think is uh, 297 by 210 millimetres, then working out what A and B is, we're going to have quite a few decimal places at that point, aren't we? Yes. So, okay, have we got another challenge with this then? I think... Because that was easy. Okay, so a challenge for everybody, I think. But including you, Alison, oh. could I combine these two tiles 
in a different way, sorry, in a way that gives us a different overall perimeter. So we had 10A plus 4B, this one here. Mm -hmm. Could I have placed this tile in a different place, in a different orientation? Are there lots of different perimeters I can get apart from 10A plus uh, 4B? Um, and if so, could people put them in the chat? Okay, so we're going to make a different shape, but using the biggest and the smallest rectangle, we're going to work out the perimeter, and then we're going to write down the perimeter in terms of A and B in the chat. Is that right? That's right. Brilliant. Okay, let's give everybody a couple of minutes to have a go at that then. I found a different way of making... 10a plus 4b oh 8a plus 6b okay has anyone else got an expression is 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 Marie Luce's expression the same as yours Alison well I told you I I'd got uh, 10a plus 4b again when I did it so oh I see and I thought you said you got it. Oh, good... hang on. No, I I think I can see how to get 8A plus 6B, yes. Uh, if I do that. I know you can't see what I'm doing, but... It's interesting that nobody's got a third way of doing it. So I think at this moment in the classroom, I would express surprise that we've only managed to find two different possibilities and I might say come on there's loads of ways that I can put them together because I can do this or I can do this or I can do this or I can do this and really what I want to start happening is I want to hear students coming up with some convincing arguments, some reasoning for why we seem to always end up getting uh, 10A plus 4B or 8A plus 6B. Oh, we've got a 10A plus 6B. I'd like to hear how to, to make that. Put it together. Ah, okay. <laughs> I okay. Think I might... think maybe I'm going to say that this doesn't count because the shape would fall apart because it's only joining at the corners. Um, yes, I think the rule is that the edges... I think the edges have to, to completely touch. But but, but I would I, I would love it if a, a child came up with that as an example because it's a really nice opportunity to start discussing how if you change the uh, the uh, parameters of the the question that you're exploring you can find some new mathematics to discover and so the idea of finding everything you can do within a set of constraints feels like a mathematical behavior that we want to encourage and the saying what if we relax one of these constraints is it, it feels very mathematical to do that but what's good is that now we're beginning to we're hoping to be able to interpret expressions so we can so so let's look at the three solutions we've got so far so one way of approaching this is to say this rectangle the large one on its own has got a perimeter of 8a plus 4b. And this tiny one then has got a perimeter of 2a plus 2b. So so 
if we put them like this, then we're going to get our perimeter of 10a plus 6b. So that explains why that, that we were able to work out what was happening with the 10a plus 6b. But also what's quite nice is, I'm going to take another a, b, is that when we got 10a plus 4b earlier, it was like this one, but with an extra two a's. And we can sort of see why that happened, because when we, I put it like that, and doing that added 2a to the total perimeter, but it didn't add any b's. And we can sort of see why, because the b that was along that side was sort of covered up and replaced by that b there, but we had the extra two a's. And so wherever we do that, we're gonna be covering up a b, but exposing a different b, but we're gonna to have to, but also what's interesting is, I can turn this round and put it anywhere, and I'm going to be adding two a's. Wherever I put this, as long as the b side of the small rectangle is touching, one of the edges of the larger rectangle, I'm going to get 10A plus 4B. So and I think the... that's what Alida means about uh, being limited because there are only two possible orientations. Because when we put that rectangle the other way round, instead of taking away a B and adding a B, but having the two A's sticking out, you've taken away an A, added an A, but you've got two extra B's sticking out. So that's why we got 8A plus 6B, because you've got an extra two B's on top of the larger rectangle's perimeter. And that's really nice, because we can then convince ourselves that those are the only two possibilities. Either the A side is touching, and it doesn't matter which side, which edge it touches. Okay, great. So that's quite nice. Um, and um, being able to interpret the algebraic expression in this way gives some meaning to it, seems important. So I've got one last challenge for everybody. Um, the challenge is, let me write it down here. Can you find some combination of tiles so that the area is 11AB? And the perimeter is 12a plus 6b. So that's the challenge. Um, it might be useful for me just to put all the pieces back together, might it? Um, yeah, I've just been trying to label my rectangles because I'm, I'm making a mess here. Um, it's okay, okay, there we go. That's this last one was four A. And two That's a lovely suggestion in the chat from Josh about a uh about a an extension question a final challenge to find the largest perimeter you can make using all of the pieces and i i guess putting together with that i would say uh convincing somebody that you have got the largest possible because the reasoning and the explanations that you need to do to convince somebody that you've made the largest possible is going to be a, a really nice uh, a bit of uh, mathematical reasoning. But yeah, I'm looking at your challenge now, Charlie. So I need to make an area of 11AB. It might be useful then for me to work out the areas of the, the pieces then. Uh, so I've got AB is the smallest. Then I've got one that's twice the area, so that must be 2AB. I'll tell you what, Charlie, I'm doing Alison. a lot of practice here, yeah? I was wondering whether to just give everybody a minute to have a go at it before you talk us through what you're doing. 
Oh, I'm do- all I'm doing at the moment is just writing down the areas on them. So I haven't thought of a strategy for what to do next. So, so what did you? Sorry, I interrupted. That. What you do? You're putting the area. I'm just, I, I've just on each of my pieces of paper. I don't know if you can see that. I've just yes. written the area so I can see. So, for example, I now know that you haven't used both of these pieces because they would have a combined area of twelve AB and your area was only 11 AB, so I can't have used those. So this is nice because I can start to eliminate which pieces you've used. So if you tell me what the areas are as you went along, I'll put them on the on my sheets as well. So the little ones are AB. The next size up is twice as big, so it's 2AB. So you can work that out either by saying I'm going to double that mm -hmm. or by thinking about 2A times, times B. B. Yeah. Uh, or you could think of it as AB plus AB because you can think about adding the two bottom areas together. So we're doing lots of uh, different ways of making the same algebraic expression, which is nice. Uh, then the one on the other side is 2B times 2A, so that's 4AB. And likewise, we can see that it's four lots of that. Mm -hmm. And that it's also two lots of that one. So when you double 2AB, mm -hmm. you get 4AB. And then that one that you've got at the top there is going to be 8AB. Okay, so I put the perimeters, the, the edges in blue and the areas in purple or pink. And my challenge is area of 11AB, a total perimeter of 12A plus 6B. I think you used three different pieces to make your shape. But you're not going to tell me if you're right. You're going to give, if I'm right, you're going to give everybody else a chance to do it. What I like about this, it feels like quite a natural way to be working with algebraic expressions without, in a very non scary way. This feels very playful. And we'd hope students would experience it that way. So a couple of people have got it. I'm wondering whether Muddy Luce or Laura, you'd like to put turn your microphone on and talk to us? When since we're not an enormous group, I think you might want to. Is that I presume that's loud, Kirsty? Yeah, yeah. Kirsty said that uh, people are welcome to to join. I, if you don't want to talk because it's being recorded, then that's fine. Um, but you can explain in the chat if if you don't want to uh, to talk. But if either of you would like to just uh, tell us a little bit about what you've done. I notice you both say that you think you've got it. There's a, a little bit of not wanting to be too certain, just in case. I can try and explain mine if you want. Yes, please. Thank you. It's, it's an I think because it's been a long day, so I can't promise I haven't made a silly error somewhere. I, I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I started with the 4A by 2B rectangle. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom of that, I've put the B by A rectangle. So the smallest, the smallest one. one. Okay. Yeah, that. And then with the, with the A edge joining or the B edge joining? With the A edge joining. Okay. Okay. And then onto the 2B side, I've put the 2A by B rectangle with the B uh -huh. sides joining. So, yeah. So, something like that. Yes. Okay, so we can check to make sure that that has the correct uh, perimeter because we know that going all the way across the top, just looking at the horizontals, 
I've got a 4A and then a 2A, so that's going to be a 6A altogether, top and bottom, so that's 12A. And then doing all of the verticals all at once, I've got a 2B plus a B, so that's 3B on each side, so that's 6B. So, yes, I agree with you. That is a way of making a shape that has the same area and perimeter as Charlie's. Uh, largest rectangle, second smallest, and the smallest one. Okay, so uh, Marily Luz, you've done it all in the same direction with the shortest sides next to each other. And so it, that's going to give, um, I think, if I, I, I know you can't see what I'm doing, but I've I've arranged it so that I can see it for myself so you'll have 4a and then 2a and then b going along the bottom and the top so that will be 12a plus 2b and then you've got 2b and 2b going down the side so that takes you up to the 6b i agree that that is also a solution so once we've got this idea of being able to calculate the perimeter in big chunks rather than having to add up and work out every bit I think that's that's really lovely. That that's not what you just described, is it? I've, I haven't got that right. Yeah, it yeah, is. that's right. Yep. Okay, so all the horizontal bits add, uh, along the bottom mm. add up to six a plus b, and the vertical bits. Sorry, along the bottom is six a plus b. Six a plus b. That would be replicated at the top. Two b. Two b. And so, yes, so we'll have a, and what's nice is from our discussion earlier, I can take this piece and I can do whatever I like with it. As long as you don't hide a bit that is contributing. So you couldn't put it into that space at the top. I can't do that. Because, no. Because, because that's I'm... then hiding one of the bits that needed to contribute to our perimeter. But then you could ask the question, what is the perimeter if you did put it into that corner? And that's something that we can work out. Yes. So before we leave this problem, I've put a link in the chat to the problem on the Enrich website for perimeter expressions. And this problem... Um, I think I might stop sharing now. And is okay. Yeah. Do you need Do you need me to share my no. Anymore? Okay. No, that's fine. So. Uh yeah, and if you did if you didn't click on that link, uh then that's all right because Charlie is very good at making sure that he sends out all of the links to all of the problems that we use, uh which means that I don't have to worry about it because Charlie does it. Thank you, Charlie. I appreciate you. Uh, okay, shall we move on to our second problem? And then we can talk about all three problems uh, together at the end. We've talked about that one quite a bit as we've gone along, I think. Is that okay? Yes. Right, so I'm going to share my screen, my whiteboard for this, because I think it will be good to jot things down. But we're also going to invite people to say some things in the chat. And I think let's start this one very straightforwardly, shall we? Uh, I want people to choose three consecutive numbers. So what I mean by that is going up in ones. So for example, one, two, and three. And then once you've chosen your three consecutive numbers, I'd like you to add them together. So I would do one plus two plus three and I would get the answer six. And then I just want you to put your final answer in chat. I don't want you to put the calculation, just put your final answer in the chat. And please, can you use positive numbers? Because if you use negative numbers for this problem, it makes me very sad. I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of time for some answers to start to come in. And once you've done yours, look at the other answers that are coming into chat and see if you can figure out 
what numbers people might have used. So two people, uh, Rika and Adam, have both got the answer 12. I suspect that you both did 3 plus 4 plus 5, because I know that makes 12. Um, Alida has worked out what everybody did. I think maybe you've got a quick way of doing this, Alida, because that was super quick. Uh, so, yeah, Laura, did you do 66 is 21 plus 22 plus 23, I wonder? Uh, yes, okay. Um, so I'm hoping that most of you can quite quickly tell what's going on here. If you do this with Year 7s, they end up thinking that you're amazing and that, that you're somehow psychic until you explain to them that it's not magic, it is in fact maths. But I'd like you to take a moment to see if you can describe a method for working out the three numbers that somebody's used if all you know is their total. And you can either pop that in the chat for us or again, if anybody would like uh, to speak to us and describe the method that they're using and how they would explain it. The mean of the three numbers is the median. So you're relating it to averages there, Alida. Okay, lovely. So if I asked you, okay, oh, oh, Laura's gone algebraic, brilliant. Laura remembered that this was about creating and manipulating expressions and has guessed where we were going to go next with this. The extra has to be three plus one plus two. After you've subtracted three, you have to split between three to have your first number. Okay, so because we're adding together uh, three consecutive numbers, we're ending up with a multiple of three. We're getting three times the middle number. And so one thing that I've done before in the classroom to represent this, uh, you can represent it pictorially as well as algebraically. And sometimes it's really nice to have the pictorial models to fall back on, particularly for students who might be less confident with the abstraction. So if I take the example of 66 being 21, 22 and 23, I can imagine a tower that is 21 high, another tower that is 22 high and another tower that is 23 high. And then I can imagine this being equal to three towers that are 22 high because I've taken this top one off the 23 and I've put it in the space for the 21 like that. And then, of course, we can start to go to the algebraic representation. And we could say that our smallest number is n and I would invite the students to say, how could I represent the number which is one bigger than N? And a lot of the time people will say, oh, because it's the letter that comes after N in the alphabet. And this is a really nice way to help students to get over that misconception because you say, well, that's no good because that looks like a zero. And I know the number isn't zero because I know that N was positive. And so instead we can say, it needs to be n plus 1 because I'm saying it is the number that is 1 more than n. And then I've got n plus 2. And then when I add all those together, I get Laura's formula, which was 3n plus 3. And so another way of writing that would be 3 times n plus 1. So this is explaining my formula of 3 times the middle number, which I did with my picture. And so I can say, I can divide by three and then just do uh, the number below that and the number 
above that. Uh, what were we going to do next with this problem, Shirley? Were we going to do five? We were going to look at five and seven and whether we could use similar reasoning to work out what's going to happen, whether we can predict what's going to happen when we have five consecutive numbers or seven consecutive numbers. Okay, so uh, I know some people will have uh, explored this problem before. So I'm going to give you uh, just about a minute or so to add together five consecutive numbers and maybe do that a couple of times and see if you can express what you think students would notice. And then we can rehearse how you could get students to explain what they notice. So what happens if instead of three consecutive numbers, I ask you to do five consecutive numbers? I'm chuckling away to myself here because I'd muted myself while I had a, 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 a little drink um, of, of juice, I hasten to add. But the uh, Zoom controls disappeared and the button to unmute myself wasn't there. And I thought, well, that's it. Charlie's going to have to do the whole of the rest of the webinar on his own. But luckily, uh, the, the, the unmute button came back again. So... Uh, that's fine. Uh, OK, so hopefully uh, you've had a chance to try adding together five consecutive numbers. When we did three consecutive numbers, we always got three times the middle number. Would somebody like to express in chat what will happen when we do five consecutive numbers? And Mary Lou's is there already. The answer will be five times the middle number. So how might students convince themselves, convince each other and convince you that five times the middle number is always going to work no matter how big our numbers get? Charlie, I think you had an interesting strategy that you said when you and I discussed this problem last week. So yes, I agree, Alida, we could do a very similar visual picture for people who needed a little bit of support. Um, but yeah, Charlie, you didn't start your numbers with N when we did it last week. What what did what did you do okay. differently? Okay, so I definitely would do what you've done initially. That feels like the most natural thing to do to start with n, <clears throat> and then add one and then add two. But if I was doing five consecutive numbers, I and I would do exactly the same as you did. Um, I'd end up with n, n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, n plus 4. Um, so I'd, I'd have 5n plus 10. Um, uh, but another way of doing it is to say, I mean, and, and this is sort of because I, because I know what the answer is. So uh, the, the reason I feel slightly apprehensive about saying this is that I remember being at school and my teacher coming up with all these kind of tricks. And it was like, yes, but I don't know how you knew that this trick was going to work. Or I didn't know. But I'll mention it anyway, despite my discomfort about it. And so in this case, of course, if I started with n minus 2 and I had five terms, I'd have n minus 2, n minus 1, n, n plus 1, n plus 2. And the reason it's it's lovely is that when I add them all up, they're up to 5n, because the, the, the minus 2 and the plus 2 cancel out, the minus 1 and the plus 1 cancel out. And then it's like sort of bleeding obvious that hmm. it's going to be a multiple of 5. And so I can I think imagine... The, the picture helps with this, because if I say that n is my middle one, and then I go either side of it symmetrically i can say that this is too taller than n and this one is too shorter than n 
And so I've sort of got this little trio here uh, fitting together in there, and I'm turning it into a rectangle uh, that is five wide and N tall. And I think this is something that is really helpful to students, particularly when they first encounter algebra, that either by using diagrams or using manipulatives, so cuisinaire rods or algebra tiles or virtual manipulatives. I know that uh, there's lots of really lovely resources out there to show images to represent the algebra because we're using algebra because we want to do that abstraction. But when you're first starting to get used to abstraction, it's taking you out of your comfort zone and being able to represent the abstract with a picture can be a nice way to bring it back within students' comfort zones again. I think that I, the... I, uh, can I just say, yeah. I mean, this is why we've chosen these two starting activities, because the algebra is representing something very concrete, whether it's the perimeters uh, and areas. And, but also... You then now start appreciating, if you see the, the the diagram and the algebra, the power of it. Because let's imagine I say to you, okay, what's going to happen if I have 101 consecutive numbers? And yes, I could do n, n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, all the way up to n plus 100. Goodness, that is incredibly tedious. And all of a sudden I can say, no, 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 no. I'm going to keep the middle one the 51st one as n, and I'm going to have 50 terms which are going to be smaller, n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way up to n minus 50, and n and 50 terms to the right, n plus 1, n plus 2, all the way up to n plus 50. I can picture it with your diagram, and I can see that the gaps on the left can be filled with the bits that stick out on the right, and I can now end up with 101 columns, all of the same size, and so the algebra and the diagram are really complement each other. And that feels like how I want students to interpret what's going on here. And I think this is really important from the perspective of proof, because whenever I encounter students preparing for their GCSEs, uh, particularly those who are slightly less confident, one of the things that they really worry about is the questions that say show that or that say prove that because it's difficult to know how you can convince somebody of something in a way that it's always going to work forever. And so this is a really nice way of showing the power of algebra to prove it because if I've used N to represent my number then I've shown that this works for any value of n. And so I've proved that five consecutive numbers will always add up to a multiple of five, and seven consecutive numbers will always add up to a multiple of seven. And 101 consecutive numbers will always add up to a multiple of 101. And being able to state that with certainty can be really, really exciting. And using a big number like 101, using something where actually sitting down and adding together 101 numbers would take a really long time and nobody would really want to do it. But to be able to say with certainty what would happen if we did, you know, it's not going to get everybody excited, but for at least some students that can that can be a really nice motivator for why algebra might be worth spending some time on. It also means that if I take a number like 15, I can tell you that because it's a multiple of three, it must be able to be written as three consecutive numbers. I know that the five will be in the middle, so it'll be four plus five plus six, but it's also a multiple of five. So, it can be written as five consecutive numbers, one plus two plus three plus four plus five. So I can take some, you know, big numbers, um, you know, uh, 55 is a multiple of 11. So it can be written as 11 consecutive numbers. No, it can't. 
I, I get up to you zero. It, no, 55 can't be because the first thing that's 11 consecutive numbers is 66. So I think you need to go bigger than 55. You'd have to include zero. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, if, if I'm allowed yeah. zero. I, You're uh, not. Okay. So that's positive but, look. But I might also... But I might also say, well, I can do 33 as 11 consecutive numbers if I'm allowed negative numbers. You're not allowed negatives. It's <laughs> got to be positive. But then this is the sort of question that can arise. Mm. These are the sorts of conjectures. And then if you ask the question, at what point, after what number, can I make the multiples of 11? Then that, again, is provoking a discussion because I need to know what I've got my n, n plus one, n plus two, and so on. Uh, so the smallest possibility is one plus two plus all the way up to 11. So what is that? And is there a quick way of working it out? And so if you want to see a resource to explore that question, there are, on Enrich, there's the problem uh, picturing triangle numbers, and there's also handshakes and mystic rows, which offers three slightly different contexts for exploring what happens when you all uh, add all of these up. I think there's, uh, there's slick summing as well. Uh, Charlie, can you just write a little note to us somewhere to put links to all of those triangle number problems uh, when we send the follow-up email? Because I won't remember yeah. that. I've just put a link. Um, to, I've just put a link to three neighbors, which has three explanations along the lines that we've been talking about. Um, but I'll I'll add the others as well. Okay. Now uh, we were going to talk about what happens when you add together because we've only talked about odd numbers so far, and we were going to discuss what happens when you add together an even number of consecutive numbers because it's slightly different we don't have a middle number anymore because when you're finding the median of an even number of things it's going to be halfway between two numbers uh i think i might leave that as something that people can explore afterwards because it is already five o'clock so we've only got half an hour left and I very much want to get on to our last problem of the day. But I, before we leave summing consecutive numbers, uh, did you put a link to summing consecutive numbers in the chat yet, Charlie? Don't I'll worry. Do, if I'll you do that now. I can. I'll do that now. Okay. Uh, so in the problem summing consecutive numbers, it does suggest some follow up challenges. And if you've never explored this problem, uh, if you if you can find a little bit of time just just to explore. This is one of my all time favorites. Sometimes I talk about in the same way as Desert Island Discs is the uh, records that you take with you if you are stranded on a desert island. Uh, I like to think sometimes about my desert island problems, problems that I keep coming back to and finding more and more richness in, more and more exciting things to think about. And summing consecutive numbers would definitely be one of my desert island problems. And the point that I love to get to with students when I'm sharing this is to pose them the challenge, which numbers is it impossible to make by summing consecutive positive whole numbers? And... If you've never explored that, I'm not going to spoil anything for you because there's some wonderful surprises along the way. Uh, but if you are desperate to know what to do and uh, you can't, if uh, if I just bring up the problem, in fact, so some consecutive numbers. The link, the link is in the chat. Uh, Liz, yeah, uh, Alison. <clears throat> I've got I've got the link. I just need to remember how to share a window in Zoom. Uh, here it is. So hopefully. If I do that, you can now see some in consecutive yeah. numbers on the Enrich website. And if you've never noticed this before, along the top of the problem, as well as having the problem, there's a button here marked student solutions. And so if you 
really don't have time to explore this problem for yourself, which is a real shame because it's such a lovely problem, but I know you're all super busy. Uh, what you can do is you can click on the solutions and you can start to have a look at what students did when this problem was live on the site. And as you go down through that solution, it explains some of the generalizations that you uh, can get to. Uh, while I'm here, I might as well mention as well, the teacher's resources for this problem uh, have a whole video introduction of uh, how you could introduce this to your class, uh, the things that you could say, the key questions that you could ask, the uh, things that you could do to support those students that might be struggling and uh, where to go to next with this problem. So that's all there and well worth exploring. Uh, I was just about to say, I can see there are some messages in chat, but I think it is just you posting links, isn't it, Charlie? I think those yes, are the problems. Okay. Yeah. Just, just to come reinforce what Alison said about adding four consecutive numbers and adding, and then thinking about what happens if you add six and eight and 10. I was working with a group of year 10 students quite recently and looking at what happened with four, six, eight, they were able to predict what was going to happen with a hundred consecutive numbers. And then being able to do this algebraically and then being able to sort of check it by adding a hundred consecutive numbers doing Sort of the Gauss method thing, so so it was it was a really nice way of being able to confirm that their prediction was correct. It's also nice uh, if you're uh, working in a school where uh, computer science <laughs> is being taught to bring a little bit of computing into it as well, because of course for adding together large numbers of numbers. It's just crying out to use a spreadsheet. So you could do a little bit of spreadsheet work with this or a little bit of programming uh, and, and you know get the computer to do the adding together uh, 100 consecutive numbers for you. OK, our last uh, main problem of the day. We do have some uh, short problems lined up just in case there's time. Uh, but our last main problem of the day Again, it's another one of my favourites, and I'm going to give everybody a uh, challenge to do in chat again. So if I can share my whiteboard once more. Um, right. So what I'd like you to do then is I want you to choose four consecutive numbers this time. Consecutive numbers. And because you're maths teachers and somebody's going to choose something weird unless I specify, I'm going to say positive whole numbers. Um, or positive integers, if you prefer. Uh, and then this time, instead of adding our numbers, what we're going to do is I want you to multiply together your first number and your last number of the four. And then I want you to multiply together the second and the third number of your four consecutive numbers. And then once you've done that, I would like you to put the answer in the chat. So because somebody else is bound to do it, I'm going to choose one, two, three and four. And so I'm going to do one times four is four, two times three is six. And so in the chat, you can just put four, six like that. Uh, so let me put that in my table of results. So first times last was four, second times third was six. Okay, so uh, 88 and 90 has appeared in the chat. Charlie, have you done one? Or are you just sitting back and relaxing now? I'm making a note of the URLs that I'm going to share later with everybody. Okay, that's fine. I'll let you off. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Josh. 10 and 12. A hundred and eighty. 
and 182. I'll see if we can get a couple more answers in. Oh, somebody called Charlie has put an answer in the chat. He must have been upset about being called out for not making enough effort. Lovely. Uh, 180, 182 has cropped up a couple of times. Um, so when I'm doing an activity like this with a uh, larger group, sometimes you'll get the same answers popping up uh, over and over again. So sometimes I will set an extra layer of challenge to it to say, uh, try and choose a set of four numbers that nobody else in the class is going to choose. And then that encourages people to go for slightly bigger numbers. I would probably allow calculators for this task because it's not going to be about the multiplication practice. It's going to be getting into the algebra. Um, and so I wouldn't want somebody making a mistake with multiplication to get in the way of what we're going to do with uh, generalization in a moment. So once we've got some answers on the board, then I uh, ask everybody to have a look. So I'm going to ask you now, uh, what do you notice? So have a look at the, the different answers that different people have given and uh, tell me what you notice. Okay, so adding two to get from the first column to the second, that seems to work all the way down. And sometimes as well as the question, what do you notice? I like to ask the question, what do you wonder? And this is crying out for the question. I wonder if this is always going to happen. And in order to show that it's always going to happen, can I try every possible set of four numbers? Well, no, because there's infinitely many of them. So how could I find out whether this is always going to work? And of course, because we've just done some in consecutive numbers, it's very, very clear in, in our minds what's going to come next. But for students, they might need a little bit of a nudge to say, well, what if our first number was n? then I would have my four numbers are n, n plus 1, n plus 2, and n plus 3. So my first times my last becomes n times n plus 3. And my second and third becomes n plus 1 times n plus 2. And look at that. We've got a motivation for doing some expanding of brackets. So... Either I've already taught my class how to expand uh, quadratic um, bracket, pairs of brackets uh, and so they can now show off their skills and practice it. Or maybe they haven't yet met this. We've done some uh, preliminary work on expanding brackets. We might have expanded brackets like the one on the left where you just got a single term outside the bracket. But we can say, well, in order to work this out, we're going to need to expand these brackets. So it's this same thing again about purposeful practice. Rather than just practicing some algebra for the sake of it, we are practicing as a side effect of working out a problem and wanting to know the answer. And I'm not going to go through how to expand brackets because you all know how to expand brackets. So I'm going to get n squared plus 3n on this side, I'm going to get n squared plus n plus 2n, so that's plus 3n, uh, plus 2 on the right-hand side. And so then I can see that the difference between the left expression and the right expression is that I need to add 2. So... So can I just check, Alison? This mm -hmm. could be used to rehearse how to multiply our bracket, but it could also be a prompt to need to learn how to multiply. So we might have find it, found it quite easy to explain what happened when we summed consecutive numbers, 
And all of a sudden, we've got these expressions we don't know what to do with them. And we might have diagrams of, for example, an n plus one rectangle and an n by n plus two split up into four cells and work out the areas of all the four cells and and then give students an opportunity to appreciate that that yes exactly as you're doing there <laughs> And, and and creating the need for knowing how to do something like this feels like a really good way of using this kind of a problem. Now, you and I also talked about possible images to explain why there's a difference of two. Since, since you've got your pen and paper out. Uh -huh. Do you want to show, because that's also quite nice, isn't it? That there is a way of showing that n times n plus three is going to be two less than n plus one by n plus two. So this is, Oh, I'm really bad at drawing. I don't know why I'm doing this. This I... Shall I draw an n by n square? Would that be a good place to start? I can draw squares. So that's my n by n square. And then if I've got n plus 1 by n, n plus 2 by n, n plus 3 by n, Uh, so what, what I'm thinking is an N by one times N by two would be that pink shape. And then N by N plus three would be the green shape. What I really like about this is I'm modeling how a year 10 student who wasn't very confident and didn't know how to draw uh, would would answer this problem. Uh, but you can see why algebra tiles would be a really good thing to use here, because then I can, you know, I can match up my uh, N with my N and then my other N with my other N. And then you can see that the difference is going to be these two single tiles here. So I've got my n squared tile that I'm building all of the rest of the shape uh, around. So I don't know why you made me draw that, Charlie, because it's a horrible drawing, but I think it gets across the uh, meaning that we were trying to convey. Is that OK? That, that's great. That's great. Okay. And, um, and it was nice that you weren't quite sure how you were going to do it as you went along. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it's really important that we model so that sometimes mathematics can be a little bit messy to start off with, and then it will suddenly all magically come out. Okay, so having but it done... also shows, Alison, why mm -hmm. actually algebra is so nice and neat, because it is much easier showing it algebraically than diagrammatically. Oh, I mean, for sure. I've been uh, working on a project this week in a school where everything that we do is geometrical. We're, the, we're, we're basically doing geometry projects. And the number of times I we've been working on something and I've got stuck and I've just switched over into algebra, either by doing some coordinate geometry or just representing things with unknowns, just because of the power of algebra to explain things. But it's really nice that we can also go the other way and we can use geometrical thinking and reasoning to explain algebraic thinking. So perimeter expressions, 
that we started with today, it unites thinking about geometrical ideas as a reason for doing some algebraic ideas. So rather than separating out all of these different parts of the curriculum, we're showing students that everything that they're doing is interconnected, that it, it's all related. And that's a really, really good message to be getting across. I know that I've spoken to students in the past who have really found it hard studying maths because there's just so much to learn. And when you start to point out the connections between the different areas, it reduces how much they have to, to learn because they can use those connections to support them. Uh, so with some consecutive numbers, then, you might think it's not a great way to practice our algebraic manipulation because we've literally just expanded one set of brackets. So, of course, the problem goes into uh, many more possible extensions from that starting point. So we can say, what if? And if we had five consecutive numbers... And so if I did one, two, three, four, five, I might do one times five and two times four and compare those answers. And rather than doing lots of numerical examples, can I predict what will happen by using algebra? Well, I can have n, n plus one, n plus two, n plus three, n plus four. And so I know that the first times the last will be n times n plus four, second times the second last will be n plus one times n plus three. And so as you start increasing the number of numbers that you've got, just like we did with summing consecutive numbers, we can invite students to look for patterns and then explain those patterns using the algebra. So this what if could move on to, if I had a hundred consecutive numbers and I multiplied the first by the hundredth and then I multiplied the second by the 99th, what would happen? What would the difference between those two answers be? And again, we're using algebra to make predictions about things that we that would be tedious to work out by hand, perhaps. And we don't have to stick to consecutive numbers. We could be talking about five consecutive even numbers or five consecutive odd numbers or four consecutive multiples of seven, or we could... And again, it's really nice, it seems to me, to say, OK, set yourself, choose one of those, do the algebra to predict, and then choose what Tim Rowland talks about is a generic example. If it works for this, chances are it's always going to work. Mm. And you're using the structure of the numbers to explain why it's going uh, to going to work. Uh, so another technique that I've used in the past that is quite nice is I want the students to do enough examples so that they have become confident. And so I say, in a while, I'm going to give you a situation and I want you to have a method for working out the example. So when I'm trying to provoke generalization, I can say, oh, I'm gonna give you, uh, I'm gonna give you 20 minutes to work on this. And then at the end of that 20 minutes, I'm going to say, uh, what would happen if I took uh, five consecutive multiples of seven multiplied by the first by the last, and the second by the second last. But I don't tell them what the numbers are going to be in advance. So they have to have a general way of doing it. And then when it comes to it, they go, oh, well, I know that consecutive multiples of seven are of the form n, n plus seven, n plus 14, n plus 21, n plus 28. And so if I do the first times the last, it will be n times n plus 28. And if I do the second times the second last, it will be n plus 7 times n plus 21. And then all I need to do is expand the brackets and I'll know what the difference is between them. 
so they are able to work generally and then use the patterns that they have noticed in order to to answer the problem and they might start realizing that they don't have to multiply out the brackets all they need to do is multiply the seven by the 21. <laughs> yes because there's some lovely structures hiding in there uh, to be discovered uh did you post the link to pair products in the chat yet charlie i i haven't because we knew we were going to do it but i will do okay Okay, so uh, let let me just bring it up because I think it's uh, useful to see what the problem looks like to make it feel familiar when you look look at it. Uh, it's I'm, I'm assuming just... everybody knows that these enriched problems that we're talking about are freely available. Um, you can go to the enriched website whenever you like. You don't have to pay or subscribe. Um, we often forget to say that. Yes, yes, this is all, this is all uh, freely available. It's a, a wonderful resource. Uh, even though I'm no longer working uh, at Enrich, I still use this stuff all the time in all of the other things that, that I'm doing now. Uh, and it, it's a really wonderful resource uh, to, to access. Uh, so this is what Pair Products looks like. You've got the student view of the problem, but then as with everything else, you've got a link to the teacher's resources, which suggests the sorts of things that you might say. It's got a link to uh, some views uh, from a teacher who had used this problem. Uh, it's got a suggestion of how to uh, start get started on the problem, and it's got an extension in there. And as ever, it's got student solutions as well. While I'm on the site, I will quickly draw everybody's attention to the fact that if I go to the secondary teacher site, uh, all of the problems that we've shared today are available through the curriculum linked problems page, and uh, they're all in the algebra collection. And in fact, you can see there are two sections for creating and manipulating linear and quadratic expressions, one for age 11 to 14, and one for age 14 to 16. And within those collections, there are also, uh, let me just navigate there properly. Uh, within the, those, there are also uh, links to some short problems, creating, manipulating linear and quadratic expressions, short problems. Uh, I don't think we've got time to actually do one of those, but we did find uh, a couple in here. Uh, starting Fibonacci, we had some fun with when we looked at it uh, last week, which is a, a short challenge. It doesn't take as long to do as a full problem. So you could drop it in as something for people to have a go at for homework before a lesson where you're going to be doing one of the longer problems. Or you could uh, drop it in as your last question on an assessment. So those annoying kids that rush through everything and finish first have got a meaty challenge to uh, to get their their teeth into at the end of the the assessment. Or just you know as a as a starter or an end end of lesson task to give them a little bit more to think about. So I think when we send out the email, when Charlie sends out the email with the links in for um, for what we've worked on today, he will include a couple of our favorite short problems in there um, for you to, to have a go at. Um, so what haven't we said, Charlie? Um, I, I think we said, most of what we'd rehearsed, we would say. Mm. Um, you've talked yeah. about purposeful practice quite often. So, because sometimes we hear that children say, oh, when am I going to ever need this? Um, we've been using the al algebra to answer questions that have been cropping up for us. Um, and in saving us a lot of time and giving us a lot of certainty that things are always going to happen. Mm. And those feel like really good reasons for studying maths. Um, I often talk about students leaving an English classroom 
And the English teacher might be very happy if children disagree about who's the most evil person in Macbeth, whether it's Macbeth himself or whether it's Lady Macbeth, because she incited him to murder the king. And and the teacher, will, as long as either the, the, the students can draw on the text, it's perfectly acceptable, acceptable to have different views. But in maths, we want the students to come out of the class agreeing and, and convinced that it, it, on a flat surface, uh, the square of the hypotenuse will equal the sum of the squares of the other two sides. I um, guess the analogy for uh, Lady Macbeth is we want students to leave their maths classroom feeling that you can be certain that you've got the answer right, but also that there can be lots of valid ways of getting there. And so it's 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 th the reason why I love maths is because I can have some level of certainty. I can know something for sure. But the older I get, the more excited I get about the fact that everybody can get to that right answer in their own slightly different way. And I think that's that's rather lovely. It's just about to tick over to half past five. I know that uh, Kirsty is very likely to want to remind everybody about uh, things like evaluations and upcoming events, but uh, it's been absolute pleasure working with everyone this afternoon. I'm so grateful that everyone has got involved in the chat and uh, that some of you are also happy to to speak and and, and share what you've done. And uh, at the end of uh, what is already a long day of teaching, we really do appreciate you giving up your time to to be here. Uh, with us so thank you so much and uh, hopefully see some of the familiar names again for the next one later in the year I'll hand back to you Kirsty. Thanks so much Alison and Charlie that was great and thank you everyone once again for joining.